appreciate again your coming. It is a privilege to worship, a privilege to serve, and it is so in this gospel meeting. The confidence that we have in our brethren, you may not meet on Friday night or Thursday night or Saturday night, save in a meeting, but the confidence we have in our brethren is that you will gather for worship and that you gather regularly. You have an influence in this community and, and uh, a responsibility, responsibility to the members of this congregation. Actually mutual responsibility. And there's no better way to uh, bind yourselves together and to fulfill that that God ordained in public worship than to set specific times to meet regularly and do so. Of course, we understand that we have the Lord's Day gathering that is essential, that is demanded of God. And then we have these good works that we perform. We gather on Sunday night, most of us do, and on Wednesday, Wednesday evening. And we have our gospel meetings. And all of that is for our good, as we said last evening. We quoted a little passage in 1 Corinthians 14. He that prophesieth preaches the gospel, speaketh unto men to edification, to exhortation, and to comfort. And that's our purpose, as... Uh, as we said. You know, there are a lot of passages in the book that uh, are very familiar to us, uh, that, a lot of, that a lot of lessons have been preached from. And I think that that's good. I think it's good for our children uh, to grow up with, uh, well, such as sermons like Brother Larry used to preach when he would preach on uh, Daniel. He preached it many times at home. One of the last times he preached it, I asked him to preach it. My children had heard it some as they were growing up, a time or two maybe. But uh, I asked him that night uh, to preach it again because I had several grandchildren there that night. We have 18. And uh, he preached it. And this was uh, when Larry wasn't always doing his best because he was having health problems and so forth. But uh, I thought he did excellently that night. He was familiar with the story, and he preached it. And uh, after the service, we tearfully embraced each other. And I explained what it, he knew this, what it meant to me. Because I had heard it for years. The same sermon, never delivered quite the same. And my children had heard it. And then my grandchildren had heard this sermon. Now, I could preach the sermon... Or other bro brothers could preach the sermon, but I doubt that any of us could preach it like Brother Larry. And so it meant something to me. It's important that we preach and re-preach the things that are good for our congregation, that's good for our children, good for our families. And I don't think brethren ought to fret too much, uh, even locally. When they have a sermon that they know is good, they know is beneficial for the congregation, I, I don't think we ought to fret too much that you know, I preached this here two years ago, or three years ago, if it's needed, or if it's something that will build up, or strengthen, or edify. And that's kind of the way that we need to look at it as preachers. And we can't always do that. It's uh, all we could, but we don't always. Uh, we, uh, we have this uh, fault, most of us who preach, that uh, we'd like to maybe present the same, but... Uh, Maybe present it in a little different fashion and maybe not preach the old standbys and, and messages that are solid and good and always beneficial, but it's probably not healthy because, you know, we preached it before. And I don't know if I preached this sermon here. I haven't been here this, that many times, but it really doesn't matter. I, I looked at this last night when I was studying and again this morning early and then a while ago too, and I thought, you know, this... Uh, I love this little approach here. It's, it's simplistic. It deals with uh, Matthew 5, where the Lord says in verse 14 and 16, 10 through 16, talks to us of being the light of the world. Uh, but there, there are some things in here that I thought, because I can in my mind's eye see our young people. And I thought, you know, this, this may help them to stand for something, to have some conviction, and, and uh, to give their heart to the Lord very early on. And, then I got to looking at that, and, I, and the premise is sound and good, but there's so much involved in this that 
It applies to those, who, those of us who are older, maybe just a little stronger, a little more emphatic, and uh, certainly usable, and so we have it tonight. I just want to talk about that, the light of the world, and that which we are. In fact, God's people have always been the light of the world. Um, Jesus quoted this, or referred to it, here in Matthew 5, but it's, it has always been so. Now what he taught there in Matthew 5, we understand 5, 6, and 7, he was talking to uh, an audience of, uh, <laughs> of essentially Jews who were under the old law and would be for some three and a half years uh, until he died on the cross. We know that. Uh, but there are a lot of principles contained therein that we, that we draw from. But what he said about being the light of the world uh, has always been so of God's people. The path of the just is, is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day, Proverbs 4.18 says. The path of the just. So whether you're a Jew under the old law, whether you're a Christian under the new, that is so. The path of the just is as a, is a shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. The eternal day. The time of, of blessing that we look forward to and, and, uh, and long for sometimes. A time uh, that uh, when judgment is passed and we, we trust to receive the welcome applaud of our Lord, well done, Thou good and faithful servant, enter thou in the joys of thy Lord. That time, the pleasurable time, and that's what it will be. We think of heaven as a place of uh, servitude and a place of worship, and we believe that is so. But the Bible says of that, of that grand experience at thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. And he's not talking about like the denominational world so often pictures it. Pictures it. He's not talking about, you know, if you like to play golf, there's a... There's a I mean, the, the, the supreme, the very best golf course you've ever seen in heaven. You like to hunt deer? Great. You know, good hunting up there. And, and just foolishness like that. Foolishness. I heard a man preach the other day, a, 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 a meeting, not a meeting, a, a funeral service. And maybe he was just being light. Maybe he didn't really mean it. It was a denominational denomina preacher. But this uh, elderly lady that had died, um, she was a good cook, an old-timey cook. And he said something about the Lord must have needed somebody that could make good biscuits. And probably he meant that just lightly and didn't mean it in fact. But to heaven's not going to be like that. But whatever it is, whatever God has in store for us, it will be without the pains and the sorrows and the griefs of our day. All of that will be gone. All the sorrows of the hour shall disappear. And we, have the, um, we will be able to bask in the sunlight of His blessed love and pleasure and delight for, uh, for an endless eternity and enjoy the pleasures of service and of worship and being together. And, and I'm, of the, I'm of the number that, uh, just to get it, give it a little aside here, I've already given you a few in the, the introduction here, but uh, to uh, believe that we will know each other in heaven, that we will have identity. I know that it's so. It is irrefutable that we will know each other in heaven because he speaks of that those who are cast out, you know, looking across that abyss, and seeing Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of God, he said, and you yourselves thrust out. He names those people. He said, even in, even, in the, even in the state of the lost, he said, you look over yonder and you'll see it and you'll know who these are. How do they recognize them? Why? Well, I don't know. And it doesn't matter. It does not matter. How will we recognize? Well, like David. Like David back home. Let's just extend this a little bit. <laughs> like David of old. You know, he said of he said his little boy when he died. He said, why, uh, he'll not return to me, but he said, I'll go to him. And how many babies are going to be in heaven? How in the world will David find his little boy? Well, I don't know. But I just uh, imagine it would be just, just uh, as easy as the Lord chooses to make it. I believe we'll know each other in heaven. Let's talk tonight about the light of the world. And this is a description of God's people I just suggested, but it's possible that we fail. And being the light of the world, we're not talking about glory for our own. Not that at all. We're talking, <coughs> excuse me, having a little problem with the throat. Uh, we're talking about uh, our being the light of the world for God's favor, for God's glory. Uh, where he said, uh, you, are, uh, you are the light of the world. The seed that set on the hill cannot be hid. Neither men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but uh, set it on a candlestick that uh, it uh, may give light unto all that are in the house. He said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. Your good works. But they're performed in such a fashion, see. See your good works. 
that they may glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now I understand, and you do too, that there are ways that you can perform good works where all the glory is yours. Where uh, the pat on the back, uh, all the accolades that are offered uh, fall on you. And it's you, you, you. And, uh, but there's also a way that we can do our good works. And many of them we do, no doubt. I'm sure you do. You're, you're a good person. You do them and you, uh, and you don't sign your name, see. And certainly in those areas, but even where people know that you do good, where people know and call you by name, uh, you, are, you are a member of the church, you are a Christian, and God is glorified in that. I really believe it. We used to, we don't use, and I don't suppose you brethren do here either, we don't use our contribution, the Lord's treasure, we don't use our contribution for the center of the world. We use it for the work of the church, for benevolency, for the preaching of the gospel, and and uh, such and such as that. We had one brother several years ago who uh, disagreed with that. He thought, well, I'll just use it for everything that came along, just about, you know, in uh, in helping people who were in need. And we would a lot of times out of, out of our pockets, but not out of the Lord's money. And his reasoning was that uh, when you give it out of your pockets, that you get the glory. And, and, and the church does it. And that's not what the Bible says. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That's what the Bible says. And it will fit about every application that you want to introduce uh, in, um, in study of that. <clears throat> well, there are several things. I guess we're going to deal with the, you know, the properties of... Um, uh, the actions of light, things like that, and just see if we can draw from this experience things that will help us in letting our light shine before the world. One of the things that's so obvious, and, and uh, whoever came to the building tonight, uh, maybe Eric, Eric, I don't know, maybe Brian, whoever came to the building tonight and flipped the switch, they did what we're about to talk about just here. When the light came on, the darkness is gone. Light eliminates darkness, and that's your purpose in the world. As a child of God, that's the purpose of you as a, as a, as a student at school or, or in the workplace that you have a job to do, obviously. And, and so far as your employee is concerned, what you do at work, that's your job and that's your purpose. But uh, living Christianity as you ought to every day of the world, and, and uh, like we sometimes sing, let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me, then you are the light of the world. And it's your purpose to, uh, to dispel darkness and to eliminate darkness as best uh, as you can. You know, I've always liked the little illustration, and I've used it in other sermons, but uh, it's, uh, it's fitting to me when we go to Genesis chapter 1, and we look here <clears throat> at the earth as it was in the, in the beginning, and how it's kind of a picture of you and myself when we were in sin, outside of the Lord, outside of the church. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, the Bible says, and the earth was without form and void, and that's the way we were. That's the way we were. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And certainly that's a picture of, of our lives back yonder, outside of the Lord. Um, our darkness was upon the face of our soul, of our soul. And that probably describes uh, the epitome or the essence of, of, of sinfulness. Darkness was upon the face of the deep, without form, without void, no, no spiritual uh, identity with us as the, as the alien sinner. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And we would say of that, He sent His only Son to die. And here we have this, this great expanse of the world. And here the Lord comes to die and, and gives of His Spirit of graciousness and mercy and forgiveness. And God said in giving His Son here, uh, as we would apply it today, but of this circumstance in Genesis 1, He said, let there be light. Let there be light. And that's what, that's what Jesus came. That's what, that's what the Lord said. That, you know, that's what the Lord said of me. Name my name. And that's what He said of you. Before you obeyed the gospel, He looked upon our soul covered there. I'm mean, without form and void. Darkness upon the face of our soul. And, and he, he would say to us, there had to be a response, see? Unlike this here, <laughs> there, there had to be a response. And so He said, let there be light. Let there be light. And how there must have been joy in heaven when it could be said of probably most of us here in this audience, and we obeyed the gospel back yonder, whenever it was, and there was light. 
and there was on. Do you remember the day you were baptized? I remember it very, very well. Been 53 or 4 years ago. I remember it very, very well. February 5th, and just kind of a cold, wintry night, foggy, uh, down on the creek. I remember the baptism. I remember walking out on the gravel bar. I remember the preacher taking me out of the hand. I was uh, almost 14 years old. Uh, preacher taking me out to, uh, in the water there, sufficient to immerse me into Christ. And as he was about to immerse me, uh, said, uh, trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. And then baptized me in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I remember that. Let there be light. And I saw fit that night to weigh the gospel. And in my life, light, light began. And God saw the light that it was good. <laughs> yes. When you obeyed the gospel, when I obeyed the gospel, God saw the light that illuminated our soul. I'm making a figurative application of this, but I like, I like the application. And it was good, he said. And God divided the light from the darkness. And we'll stop there because that's kind of my point, see. God divided the light from the darkness. He doesn't want you to live like the devil. He wants you to live a good life, a godly life, a pure life, a life that's above reproach. And we'll just look at some things shortly in our next little point here that uh, introduce things that I think we need to consider. This, this obedience to the gospel, this letting Jesus Christ into our heart and giving God our heart, um, it, it, it improves us personally, individually, as we mix and as we sojourn and as we, as we learn to worship God. It helps our families. It's help, it, helps our, it helps our person. In fact, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10, the Bible says, Jesus Christ abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light, brought it to light, through the gospel. Through the gospel. You know, there's a little line over there in, in uh, the first Corinthian letter that is, uh, that is worthy. <clears throat> he talks about the gospel of our Lord. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you, verse 1 of chapter 15, 1 Corinthians, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep a memory of what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. That's the Gospel, friends. Now, that's the foundation of the Gospel. That's not all of the Gospel. That's just the foundation of it, you see. Because there's nothing said there in this little passage in that uh, 1 Corinthians 15. There's nothing said there about obedience or about our responsibilities in worship or anything like that. In fact, the, the, what reminded me of that passage was what I just quoted there in 2 Timothy 1 and 10, that Jesus Christ hath brought life and immortality, listen to me, brought it to light through the gospel. Well, where's life and immortality? Through gospel obedience, you see. And it came through the gospel. So the gospel is broader than the foundation. The house is greater than the foundation. But the, but the foundation is essential. It is necessary. It is absolutely, irrefutably demanded. Uh, in, in, uh, in, well, in building, for instance, even in common things, and certainly in our obedience to the Lord. And so when we obeyed the gospel, uh, darkness was eliminated from our lives. We stumble and make mistakes, though, don't we? We certainly do, but it can be eliminated again through the, what we call the second law of pardon in repentance, confession, and, and prayer. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another, the Bible says, um, that, you, uh, the, the, that you may be healed. Effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. If we confess our sins well, um, each to the other, one to the other, if we confess our sins, is the, is, this, is the quotation, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And so God wants us to be uh, outside this, uh, this area of darkness. He wants, to, he wants us to embrace and, and uh, emanate light from our person and from our, from our living. And so, and this is kind of, it kind of goes together here, the second point I want to share with you. Light eliminates darkness, and I just want to talk about how it eliminates it. It eliminates darkness by illuminating. 
illuminating. That's what happened when the Lord came. When the gospel was given and the plan of salvation and how to worship and all that's contained in this blessed volume just here. When it, when it came and when the message was, uh, was offered and when it was delivered, it illuminated the world. He brought it to light. That's what the Bible says. He brought it to light. This, uh, this plan of salvation, He brought it through the gospel. You know, uh, in the tabernacle service back yonder, uh, we sometimes alluded, I think, made mention a little sermon I preached sometime that I enjoy preaching about the tabernacle, type and antitype, shadow and substance, you know. It's interesting to me. And uh, we, we talk about the candlestick that was in the tabernacle. And the tabernacle, the holy place, is, is a type of the church. And the most holy place is a type of heaven. And in the tabernacle, there's a candlestick. And what it did, it sat on, over on the on the south side of the tabernacle, the tent there. And what it did was um, illuminate the inside of that, of that uh, structure there, the tent structure, the tabernacle. It, it illuminated so that the priest could see how to move about, so that the priest could see how to, how to worship, if you please. And that's exactly, that's precisely what the Word of God does in our life. It illuminates darkness. How would you know... Oh, what can we illustrate with here? How would you know what you observe? Well, you wouldn't even know if there was a communion if the Bible didn't say mention that. But, but the Lord talks about Matthew 26, about uh, the Lord's Supper there. But if, if there was nothing in God's Word that reflected upon the day of observation, like Acts 20 and 7, and, and that, uh, that coordinate passage in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, if these passages were, weren't there, when, we would not know exactly when the Lord wanted us to, uh, to observe the communion. But this, this area of darkness here, that, of ignorance, the Lord eliminated, eliminated that. And He gives us an insight into when to observe the Lord's Supper. That is, we go to the Bible example. And you can't do any better than doing Bible things in Bible ways. We go to the Bible example, and there we see how the early church functioned under the sanction of an apostle, see? And that's important that you remember that. If you brethren get together and have a little business meeting, and uh, one of you brethren say, Brother Brian says, uh, you know, uh, everybody's busy on Sunday. Why don't we start having communion on, on, uh, on maybe Friday night, kind of clear up our weekend, and uh, we, we might get, to get, get together once on Lord's Day and sing and maybe make a little talk, but uh, we have communion on Friday night. And uh, one of the brethren might say, well, that's all well and good, but... Uh, but what, what Scripture will allow us to do that? Well, Brother Brian or Brother Mike or Brother David, whoever might, might suggest that, there's nothing they can say. There, there's no Scripture to give them any, any inkling that that would be all right. But then we observe the Lord's Supper on Lord's Day, and so every Lord's Day, and so our work fellows, they say, uh, tell me about the Church of Christ. What do you folks believe? You know, I've heard that uh, you believe you have to go to church every Sunday, every Sunday, you can't miss, and that you have to partake of, of uh, the Lord's Supper every Sunday. Is that right? And you say, yes, that's, that's right. That's what we believe. Well, why do you believe that? Well, you say, well, you know, this is what the early church did with the Apostle Paul attending their service, so we know what they did was right. We know it was correct. So we cannot be wrong in doing that Bible thing, the Bible enjoined action. We cannot be wrong in doing it in the Bible way, on the Bible day. And your work fellow would say, oh, I understand that. I understand that. If you take it on Thursday night or Friday night, they say, why do you take it on Thursday night or Friday night? I, I, I thought everybody pretty well took it on Lord's Day or on, on Sunday. And you might say, well, yes, uh, we used to do it that way, but uh, we just, uh, you know, we just kind of like Thursday night better. There's no authority in that. There's no comfort in that, see? And so, by the Bible, my point is simply this, the Bible illuminates the darkness. In, in, in every area, uh, the issues of the day that face the church, the Bible is here for our illumination. And I like the idea that uh, whatsoever doth make manifest is light, as is taught in Ephesians 5 and 13. And when we apply that to God's Word, everything that, it makes everything visible, easily seen, easily ascertained, easily discerned, then we perform. 
You know, just like the Bible says, whether it's the gathering of the Lord's Day for the communion, setting the table, how we set the table. You know, I can illustrate with that. You, uh, I notice you folks, your work fellow says, uh, maybe visit your assembly, and I notice you folks um, had one cup on the table. I don't understand that. Everybody drinks after each other. Uh, you, and you just had one loaf, and everybody takes a little part of that loaf. And why do you do that? And, and so you would tell them like you did in Acts 20 and 7, see. You read over there to them and like... Oh, Mark 14, you know, he took the cup and gave it to them, and, and they all drank of it. And, and the fellow would say, like he did today, he'd say, oh, well, I see that. May not agree, may not think it's necessary, but he sees, he sees your reasoning, especially if you little, lend a little emphasis to that, and you say, you know, and the Apostle Paul said in verse 2 of 1 Corinthians 11, that we are to keep the ordinances as delivered. See, you're talking to your work fellow. The Bible says we're to keep the ordinances, and one of them is the Lord's Supper here. We are to keep the ordinances as delivered. And then Paul also said in uh, 2 Timothy 3.14, But continue thou in the things thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, being taught by the apostles, see? And so your work fellow would again say, I understand that. I, I understand that. You have illuminated something to him. Well, you really haven't. Well, you have, you have. Give you the, give you the credit for your work there. But actually, it's the, it's the revelation of, God, of God's Word that has really been, uh, been the glow of the candle or, or whatever that has, that has done the job. I like to think that in every facet, every area of Christian, every area of Christian life, that, that's what, uh, that's, uh, that, that is our responsibility. Oh, oh, oh. He said, let your light so shine before me. I don't understand that to me, you know, before Mike and Marilyn here and Sister Helen and all the rest of you folks at church. I don't understand it to mean that only. Uh, I mean, yes, that, but not exclusively. When he said, let your light so shine before me, uh, to me, just uh, it fits life. It fits life. You don't go back there. When he said, uh, he said uh, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but set it on a candlestick uh, that you know gives light to all that are in the house. And so, is he saying there? Is he saying a city that is set on a hill? That's what we are. Let your light shine before me. In. Is he saying that that's the world? That's the world. The church out in the world is like a city set on a hill. It cannot be hid. You're visible. You're your neighbors know you, you see. The people you work with, the kids you go to school with, or whatever. Everybody sees it. You're like a city set on a hill. And then he said, neither the men light a candle and put it under a basket, under a tub, uh, but rather it sets it on a candlestick so it may, may give light unto all the house. Maybe, maybe he has an allusion there, maybe to the Lord's house, or maybe to our families, maybe that. Maybe to our families. I like to think of it like that and extend that over into our church family. But you know that's the way it ought to be. At, that's the way it ought to be at home. That's the great, and I probably should have said or could say add to that grave responsibility of mothers and daddies in raising a family. Oh, it's so important, so important that we and grandparents, grandparents, that we remember that we are we are like we're like a candlestick in the home, and our children are watching us. They are picking up on on our excuse me on our attitudes, our dispositions, the way we talk to each other. Uh, you know, sometimes things get gets a little out of sort around the house, don't they? I mean, there's sometimes a little thing said that maybe shouldn't be said. Uh, in aggravation between a husband and a wife, and about all we need is just a little reminder from little Johnny over here, or Susie, that they heard all of that. And we're ashamed of ourselves, see? But that's so. We are, our, our children do so much, I mean, they learn so much outside of, of the verbal. Zig Ziglar used to say uh, that his mama always told him that uh, children more attention pay to what you do than what you say. Is that right? Lessons and character building incidentals in life are better caught than taught, we sometimes say. And that is so. And so here in this area of light, illuminating darkness, when we get up in the morning and go out into the world, leaving the home, we've talked a few things there, a few things there about the home. 
But when we go out in the world with uh, our speech, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of saying, because of what the Lord said in Matthew 5, 14 through 16, because of that, we're kind of saying now, now, uh, look, at, look at me, world. Uh, you folks at work, now you watch me. You people at school, you kids at school, you watch me because I'm a Christian and, and what you see in me, the way you hear me talk today is the way a Christian ought to talk. That's what we're saying. I mean, if the fellows you work with, your neighbor knows that you are a Christian, you're a member of the Church of Christ, you worship here in Norton, they know where you worship and know all about you in that area, and, and, and really what you're saying, you look at me, I'm, I'm a representative, I'm a picture of my brethren and my sisters who meet at Clark Mill Road, whatever the address is here, in, in, in Norton, Ohio. You know, that ought to make us stop and think when it comes, comes to, our, to, our, to our speech. Brother Charlie Klein, he had a little lane that led down to his acreage there in Missouri where he, before he moved to Springfield. And at the uh, upper end of the lane, right up by the main road, dirt country road, was a Catholic priest. Foul mouth. Awful mouth. A priest. Brother uh, Bob Weaver, Robert Weaver in uh, Banks, Oregon, has told me several times about his work on wells. He was a, a well man. He would repair water wells. And going out to where some of the other fellows he worked with couldn't go out and, and, and work for the, the priest because he was so obnoxious. The way he, the way he tried to deal with the people. And, and Bob shared with me of this man who's supposed to have been a man of God in the, in the Catholic hierarchy. Uh, filthy mouth. I mean, rough uh, Cursing, uh, just ugly, ugly. See, what kind of... Now, that's an extreme, and you're not like that at all, but, but maybe we need to look at our speech and how we talk to our fellows and how we, uh, how we uh, relate to them and such. And so, just with this idea in mind, listen to me today because you're going to hear me talk just like my brethren talk down at church, the rest of them, you know. And the way a Christian ought to talk, we're all on the same page. We go out... We go out the door to work or to school or wherever. And, and uh, ladies, this may be applied a little more to you but, uh, than it does to the men because the men dress differently than you. But to you would say, look at me, world. I'm a godly woman. I'm a godly woman. I'm a member of the church of Christ, the Lord's church. I live to please Him. Look at me, world, because I'm a representative of Jesus Christ's daughter. Watch me. See how I dress. And so looking at it like that, it makes it a little more serious, doesn't it? It makes, it makes us want to look at because of our image before the community and before the world to, to, be, to, be, to be different. I don't mean oddball. I don't mean oddball. But I mean, I mean in, a, in, a, in a ridiculous sort of way. But I mean to be different in the sense that we are a purchased and a set-apart people, or as the Bible calls it, a peculiar people there. Which incidentally, that word peculiar is really not... It's not uh, maybe not uh, the kind of a peculiarity that people would like to attach to it and maybe attach to it wrongly, but it, but it does mean in the Greek, in the Greek, the word peculiar, it means beyond the usual. Think about that. You're not ordinary out here in society. Beyond the usual. And so you have a responsibility in that area. Morally, morally, you have a responsibility to show the world that you are above the immorality of our day. I remember preaching a meeting in Austin, Texas one year, many, many years ago. And I talked a lot about worldliness in that sermon that night. <clears throat> I talked about drinking and, and, uh, and gambling. And, and uh, I talked about tobacco and, and several things. And dancing. Several things I brought in. And would you believe that after the sermon, there's a brother and sister, a young couple in the church, outside the front entrance of the building. I mean, they let me have it. They didn't agree at all. They, they had a little girl here about three years old, and they were defending about everything. They were defending drinking. Uh, they were defending dancing particularly, uh, and tobacco. That it wasn't wrong. That it wasn't wrong. Because, you know, we can harm our bodies other ways, like overeating. And I understand that. I understand that. We're talking about some general principles here of, of uh, that the world may not look, uh, look upon as, as moral, um, a, a moral matter. 
Some of them, I think, are moral matters. They will lead to moral matters. And uh, I, I was taken aback. Particularly on the dancing thing, I guess it really struck me because you know what dancing does in our current society and has always done and, and, and so forth. You, you understand that. And so what really ended that part of the conversation was when I, when I uh, said to the mother, and they're talking about what's wrong to date out, date, out, date out of the church, and I don't know what all, just on many, many things that they disagreed about everything I said, I guess. And so now here this fellow, I was telling them, your, your daughter's 16 or 17 years old. And the stutter down the road, you don't know him, looks pretty rough, but he comes knocking on the door because they've uh, been talking on the telephone, and and, uh, and she has uh, conjured up, a, worked up a little date here, and it's not going to bother you to let to let your daughter uh, go out with him that night, knowing that they're going to a dance. Not going to bother you. She backed up a little bit. See, it brought it home because this was her little four-year-old daughter, and she wasn't thinking. She wasn't thinking 12 years ahead or 13 years ahead. She was thinking about today just to argue with a preacher, I guess. Attitude. You know, like things like temper. Uh, we need to look at this because what we're saying in our attitude to the world, we, we, you know, the light illuminates the darkness. It just lets the world know what, what true Christian light is. And so, and so we say to the world, you just watch my conduct today. You, you observe my attitude. Because that's the way the rest of my brethren are down at Clarksville Road. <laughs> and I'm a Christian. We're all Christians. This, you just watch my attitude today. And some people don't look at it that way, I guess, that seriously, like the brother that one brother told me of who was working with him on building a house and something went wrong. I don't know what it was that Knowing the brother who was angry didn't have to be very much. But uh, he was kind of, the brother that told me about it was kind of laughing about it, but he's kind of disgusted too. The fellow took his hammer and threw it clear across the house. It was just the stud walls up, you know. And I guess it went between the studs and just, I mean, uh, that's real Christ like, isn't it? I mean, nothing wrong with throwing hammers. I'm just talking about his, his attitude there, his, his temper, just uncontrollable. And just made a fool of himself, just to be blunt. Certainly he didn't make any headway in promoting his, his image. Things like the way we pay our debts, uh, you know, we would say to the world, you, you, uh, you look through my, my bills here, you look through my receipts, and, and then we would say that, of course, because we're private people. We would say, we, I'm just to illustrate here, here's a stack of bills that I've had since uh, January 107. You look through them, and and, and you look at uh, the due date, and you look at when they were paid, and if they are paid, and, and uh, because uh, I don't care, because I'm a Christian, and this is the way Christians pay their debts. See? And you just think about that. When you make an obligation, you have an obligation. You, in a sense, you, in a sense, like when you, uh, like the credit card thing, you, you buy something with a credit card, and you sign your name, you're agreeing to pay that, you know, within uh, the stipulated terms of your credit card, your credit card agreement, and and you 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 bind yourself when you sign your name. You're not doing, you're not signing your name just because the clerk says sign here or shoves the receipt across the counter for you to sign. You're not doing it just for that. You're doing it because it's required, because it's it's an attestation that you're going to do what you said you would do when you got the credit card. You see, and it can be so of other things that you buy. Um, Brian was telling me today of some of the scams that he's faced, and, and we all have. We've been in business, uh, and it's there. It is there. So for our young people, you young people, you think about you think about your Christian image when it comes to this, the way you deal with others, the way you pay your debts, your, your attitude, your disposition, the way you dress and conduct yourself, and, and the way you treat your mother and your dad and your grandparents and, and all of that. Just, just think about this so that it may help you just be a better person. When you, like uh, Jonathan Leanne here, just newly married, married a year tomorrow, I think, uh, I, I thought that was the case, and Sister Lisa at home said she thought that was, that was the case, and Leanne confirmed it today, a year tomorrow. But uh, what a blessed time, what a good time to get off on the right foot in, uh, in, in, in lending a good family image, <laughs> a good image as a... As a husband and wife that, that love each other, and by and by, well, when children come, 
but in the matters of paying their debts and matters of attitude, and what a sweet thing that is. What a sweet thing to begin very early on. You know, some of us, some of us who are older may not have learned exactly how to perform and do things like we should do from a Christian standpoint, maybe until we were a little older and may have made some mistakes back yonder. Maybe we're ashamed of them, see? But uh, what a good thing to instill within our children the spirit to don't make the same mistakes we did, to rise above that and to show Christianity as it ought to be, as it ought to be shown. I'll tell you, I like, to, I like to talk about this little point here, the third point, that uh, light uh, <coughs> comforts and uh, light, uh, light cheers. Uh, there's a brother in uh, Charleston told me one time, he said, Jerry, he said, when I retire, I'm leaving Charleston. And I said, why is that? He said, do you know the sun, I mean, uh, through uh, record, records, the sun shines less in Charleston than anywhere else in the United States in a year? It's less days of sunshine. And so we all appreciate sunshine. Uh, of course, we like a good rain and all, but we like, we like the pleasantry of that, that. You know, the Bible, the Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes 11 and 7, truly the light is sweet, and a pleasant thing it is for the eyes to behold the sun. And for years I misquoted that. I just learned it wrong, I guess. A lot of verses, you know, we really don't try to memorize. We just read things a lot and pick them up. And I, I learned that one wrong. I quoted it, uh, To the light is sweet and the pleasant thing it is for the eyes to behold the rising of the sun. There's a little difference there. It doesn't make a lot of, a lot of difference, I suppose. But uh, because the rising of the sun to me is pleasant. If I'm traveling east and just to watch it come up, uh, I, I love it. I love it. But just the light of the day, it's a pleasant thing. And I think of Bob examples of that. And, and that's the way we ought to be as Christians, you know. A pleasant thing. We're the light of the world. We're the light of the world. I think of the experience of the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 27. You know, they'd be under that. I don't, I don't know what they call them in the Mediterranean. I don't know if they have hurricanes in the Mediterranean or not. But whatever it was, uh, typhoon or I don't know. But whatever it was, you're Oclodon. You, you remember the story. And how that for 14 days, you know, they hadn't eaten at all. And it was just really, a, really a frightening, ter uh, terrifying. Frightening is not a good word. It was a terrifying experience. I can't imagine uh, what m they must have endured during those 14 days of, of, intense, uh, uh, of intense storm there. And uh, as the shipmen there on that 14th night, about midnight, they, they, uh, the shipmen deemed they were drawing near to the land. And they sounded and found that it was uh, about 120 feet deep about 20 fathoms, and then we went a little further and sounded again. It was about uh, uh, 15 fathoms or 90 feet deep, and so they knew that they were rapidly, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the sea, the, the depth of it was, was becoming more and more shallow, and so they cast four, out, four acres out of the stern, the Bible says, to stabilize the ship, to stop the ship's movement, its uh, progression toward the shore where shipwreck would have been imminent, and they stopped, they cast, they, 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 uh, to stop the ship, they cast the anchors out of the st uh, stern, the Bible says, and they wished for the day. Well, what difference does that make? What difference does daylight make? Well, it makes all the difference in the world, doesn't it? You mothers that have set up with sick babies all night long, or daddies, and just fretted a fever you couldn't, get down it seems and couldn't really tell if the little one was any better or not and and it was just such a pleasant thing when the sun came up and daylight was there a pleasant thing it is a comforting thing it is for the eyes to behold the light truly the light is sweet you know i i think that's the way it ought to be of of christians as the light of the world i think we ought to be pleasant to be around it would be pleasant to be around. Uh, I saw a little sign out today wherever we were. don't know where it was. But it talks about uh, everybody brings happiness to the office. And then it said, either when they come or when they go. And so that's right. Do you, uh, you know, what kind of a, what kind of a, aura do you have? Do you, do you project? Do people enjoy you? I realize some people are not really outgoing, and that's all right. That's all right. But people are not outgoing. Are you pleasant 
I mean, are you the light of the world? Do they enjoy being around you? Or are they kind of glad when you leave? And every one of us need to look at our own selves in that. And, and uh, you know, Jesus said in, in uh, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, He said, uh, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. He said, For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your soul. My yoke is easy, and he said, My burden is light. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I just thought what a sweet expression that is when we apply it to, to our own lives. You know, Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live with the faith of the Son of God who, who loved me and gave Himself for me. And so, what was the little song I alluded to a while ago? Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. And so Jesus says to the world, to the hurting sinner, uh, church member or whatever, uh, come to me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Why shouldn't that be said of us? Maybe when folks are on hard times, maybe have lost a dear one, a loved one to death, or are sick, or having, uh, having family problems, problems with the children, or any, any number of things, why, why can't we be that way? Why can't we say, I don't mean we would say it to people, but if we're Christians, and we are the light of the world, like Matthew 5 here projects, if we're that, why isn't it so of us that people just can't hardly do anything else but to give you a call because they're having problems now, they're hurting, or they need some advice, or they need some counsel, and, and so they say, I know what I'll do, I'll call Sister So-and-so and I'll talk. She's always a help. She's always good for me. Or I'll talk to Brother So-and-so. He'll help me with this. Or, uh, or he'll, uh, he'll see me through. Or, or whatever the case may be. I, I, it just seems to me that we, if we are the image of Christ and, and we are the light of the world, it just seems to me the right thing to do. The right, the right honor. The right spirit to have and to emanate so that when people think of, 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 being, uh, of needing someone, uh, that, that they would think of maybe several sisters in the church or maybe several brothers in the church. You know, I'm learning. I'm learning more in the world. There's a, it's, it's, it happens in the church too. But more in the world. I'm learning that there are a lot of people that just don't have any friends. Don't have any friends. Uh, we have a very dear sister at home who is just a lovely person, just outstanding to deal with people, especially people who are hurting, Sister Lisa Scott. And uh, she has more people who have told her that they have not a friend in the world. And they come to her. She's, and they confide in her. And I'm talking about people of the world. Lisa keeps a little, uh, not a little boy, he's 30, 38 years old, but he's uh, mentally handicapped. But he's, uh, he's about 7 or 8 years old, pleasant to... Uh, T.J., pleasant guy to be around, and we all just love him to death. And uh, you don't think of him being 38 years old. Uh, you just think of him being, as being T.J. But his mother, his mother, this only child they, they've had. Uh, the doctor had her on diet pills while she was carrying the baby, and they think this is what caused the problem with T.J. But all these years, she told Lisa, she said, I haven't had any friends. And now she'll call Lisa and project it like this. She'll say, this is your best friend. Well, Lisa has avoided saying, calling her her best friend because she has several best friends and they're all in the church, you know. But she does consider her her friend. And I'll just use that as an illustrate, to illustrate that, uh, you know, you sisters can be like that. And, and you may not be that kind of person to everybody, but... Uh, it would be sweet if being the light of the world that you, uh, certainly with our young girls here and maybe even the boys, uh, that, you, that, that they can ask somebody to talk to. Do you know that sometimes these young men can talk to the older sisters easier than they can an older brother? I know, I know a lot of young men who just poured out their heart to, uh, to Sister Lisa and uh, just bared their soul, their faults and and what they wanted to do and the, the, the hindrances that they had and, 
and uh, how much he has helped people along the way. Come to me, Jesus said, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. I, it just seems to me that that ought to fit you and myself as, as Christians. You know, uh, light <clears throat> directs, it sometimes does, and, and uh, shows the way, and, and that's what we ought to be as Christians. Uh, I, I think of uh, when I was a boy in the, the San Joaquin Valley, California. I think of, uh, you know, we, we, were, we were poor and uh, we didn't have a lot. Uh, we didn't go places. We weren't worldly or whatever. We didn't have the money to be worldly if we wanted to. But uh, just very common people. But we would go to the fair. It came, came every fall. A little county fair, just a small county fair. We go to the fair, or something like that. You know, look at the livestock and various, you know, and maybe ride a few rides and such as that. But we lived out in the country a long way, several miles from town. And uh, when the fair would uh, come in, come to town or set up, and like they did, and you, you I know some you older people know this, have seen this yourself. I know you have, and probably the younger too. They may still use it for advertising. I don't know, but but they had these huge these huge lights, like three foot across or whatever. And the beam would just pierce the night sky. They had two of them. They would, you know, rotate and cross. The, the beams would cross. And, and I thought that was the neatest thing. And I never will forget the first time I ever saw the lights. You know, we'd, they kind of showed where the fair was. See? It guided people to the fair. And when we went there and saw the lights, I thought, that is, that is cool. That is all right, you know. And, but, but their purpose, their purpose, that's what you are. Except, I don't know how many candle power that light had, but you have about 10,000 times that, you see. If you, in, our, in our dark world, if you'll just let your light shine like you can and like you ought, well, who knows how much good you might do. People look at you and you, know, you, you young girls, and, or maybe some of you grown women or, or men or whatever, and uh, they'll say, you know, that's the sweetest woman. Or that's the best young young girl, or best young thing, you know, and just commend you, or maybe the young men, and and uh, who knows what you may do in at least pointing them in the direction of the church. They may know where you worship. You may not have a Bible conversation with them. You may not have that. But they know where you worship and all, and know you're a Christian, you're a member of the Church of Christ, very likely, and so you you kind of show them the way. I think of uh, Abilene, Texas. The congregation has uh, disbanded since uh, we used to go there and preach. The leadership passed away and other people moved away. But uh, when you left Abilene, Texas at night after preaching, Sunday night or gospel meeting or whatever, just outside of town, just outside of town on Highway 36, you'd look off to your right and the little airport uh, was on the outside there. And there was these red lights on either side of the runway, just straight as an arrow. Now, I know they have radar and, and all, and, but they still have the lights today. And I don't know how they use them. I guess it's just an addition. Maybe I'm sure it's a help in a lot of ways, visual as well as radar, but, uh, but it, it guides the way. It illuminates the way. Here, here is the way. Here's, here's, the, here's the landing strip right here. <laughs> Save between the lights. See? That's what you do. That's what we do. We go out in the world. You know, we say, here's the way. Here's the way. This is the way you live. This is the way you obey the gospel. This is the way you worship. Just stay between the lights. You know, God's Word. This passage and that passage, you know, just stay between the lights. I remember as a boy, my brother and I hunted a lot at night. Oh, you know, uh, we did a lot of frog hunting back in those days. And we, were, we hunted a lot, I mean, daytime, but, but particularly at night, things like that. Yeah, but uh, well, the, the, the creek there where we, where we hunted, uh, basically, uh, there were a lot of eucalyptus trees and such. And uh, <clears throat> Mama always left the light on. You know, we, as I said, we lived in the country and our house was kind of up on a hill. Always left the kitchen light on. And the family's already in bed. And, and whichever one of us, my brother, my brother Hickman, or myself, whichever one of us would come out of the, 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 the uh, brushy or the, the eucalyptus area there, whatever, whichever one would step out and just about invariably, it wasn't something we proposed, it was something that just came out, whichever one came out first and would see the house, we'd say, there's the house. There's the house. 
Well, the other one knew it, or would soon know it when they walked out, but just something about that, you know. And Mama didn't have to leave the light on in, in the window. We knew where the house was. You see, we hunted that place a jillion times. But I don't know, I guess Mama just wanted us, maybe it's just a Mama thing, you know. She wanted us to know she cared, and so she, she did that. And so we had that light, we had that light in the window. And, you know, I think about our children. Sometimes we have problems with our children. And God forbid that it happen to any of you young people here. We hope it's not the case. We hope you just think seriously about life. And, and you know, there's, you can have a good time in Christ. You don't have to go out here and do drugs and, and uh, be immoral. and You don't have to do all that stuff. You can have a good time in Christ and, and, and sleep good about it and, and, and make your mom and daddy happy. And, and people love you to death because of it. And... And just, just remember, just remember when you're out there, just in your mind, think, there's the house. You know, I think of the prodigal son there in Luke chapter 15, as he, uh, as he was musing over his despicable state, and, and here he was, you know, just desiring, he fain would fill his belly with the husk which the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him, uh, which probably was for his good, you know. I mean, just went ahead, and he went to the bottom there, and he said, uh, you know, back home, my father's servants, they have plenty to eat and they have a bed to sleep in. And, and here I am out here, I perish with hunger. And he said, I know what I'll do. I'll just go back home. And I'll, I'll just tell my father that, Father, I've, I've sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no, worthy to be called, no more worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. Would you do that? Would you give me, would you give me a job? And that was good that he did that, but, you know, that's not where his glory was. His glory was when it says he arose and he went. He rose and he came to his father. And, but, uh, but just look at that story there. Look at that. Now, it's really a story of the, of the, of the mercy of a father, the kind father. It's a story of the prodigal son. It's a story of the, of the selfish and ugly older brother, you know. But just let's think about that story. We could not have that story if there wasn't if there wasn't a light in the window, if there wasn't a father at home that cared for the boy. And he knew that. There's a lot of reasons why you brethren need to keep the worship here clean and pure. There's a lot of reasons why you must continue to be careful of, of the way you set the, the table. Or those that you may allow in your pulpit those whom you extend fellowship to and such as that. It's very important, not just for, not just for your conscience sake, although we try to live in harmony with that, as long as it is, is it's Bible uh, structured and all. But, but think about the children if they go astray and, and then someday, you know, want to come back and then there's nothing to come back to, not what they learned. They learned about pure and unadulterated, un unadulterated worship. They learned the Bible way about the way the table's set and, and our singing and, and all of that. They have learned the Bible way and they know what the Bible teaches. You've read it to them. You've illustrated it to them. They know what the Bible says and they want to come back and here you folks are either disbanded or, or the worship corrupted or who knows what. Who knows what. A lot of responsibility placed upon us as parents. A lot of responsibility. All those other things. Just take these things home with you. We've run out of time. Think about and extend this. Lights sometimes serve to warn. You know, like our traffic control. And you can be a light. You know, the, the, the traffic control, the light, the red light, stop. Don't do this. Don't go here. The caution. Oh, be careful in this area. Be careful in this area. It can be dangerous, you know. Be careful. And the green, this is good. This is right. Perform that. But you can as a Christian. You know, like Brother Ivan McAllister from Charleston back yonder when he was worshiping, his brethren were worshiping. Uh, they would go to work, work on Sunday, and then come back. Sometimes they'd come to the church building and have a second communion service. Or they'd go to some brother's home and have what's sometimes referred to as the, as the convenient assembly. And every preacher that went there for years and years and years preached on that and tried, talked to those brethren personally and tried to get the thing straightened up. And it went on for years and years. And finally, Brother McAllister, in his older years, decided he'd put his job on the line. 
And he did. And he went and told his boss he couldn't do it anymore. He couldn't work on Sunday anymore. What he should have done many years before, but the boss said, that's all right. That's all right. See, he didn't know, he didn't know that. But he said, that's all right. And he gave him another job. We wouldn't have to work on Lord's Day. But, but the thing was, Brother Ivan, what makes me appreciate him, he's dead now, what makes me appreciate him was he made the decision and the choice. He didn't know he'd have another job. He didn't even know if he, if he would have a job. See? And he did the same thing with tobacco. He used tobacco for years and years and years. And then he wrote a little piece to put in the paper, the light, against tobacco. He'd quit. He'd quit. And uh, by the time we got the piece, and no, no, this is another time, I guess. In any case, we, yeah, we reprinted. This is what it was. We, 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 printed. we printed his piece about, about tobacco. And then a few years later, he developed young lung cancer. And he died. And so with his obituary, I reprinted his piece against that. And so he was, he was there as a light, see, like we might be in other areas. And, and just remember that, that light is for the benefit of others. And, 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 and it is so. And, and that light, uh, it'll cost you something to let your light shine. Somebody's going to pay a light bill here for these lights tonight. Somebody will pay a light bill. It costs to let your light shine. You have, a, you have a campfire, you're sitting there around the campfire, you're enjoying it. It's costing something for that light. I mean, the wood is burning away. Or maybe, maybe you have a light in a Coleman lantern. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's propane or maybe it's a, a, a Coleman fuel or whatever. But it, it's costing something to, to I'm not talking about dollars here. I'm talking about uh, the utility, the usage of the, of the commodity that causes the light to be. The oil is burned up. The wax of the candle. And on and on and on. See? It costs something. And it'll cost you something. It'll cost me something. Maybe some of our... Excuse me? Maybe some of our rights. Maybe some of our privileges. For the good of the church. For the sake of the church. Don't you love the Lord that much? Well, I sure you do. Sure you do. And so... There's a cost on the other side too. Uh, somebody says... Nobody pays a dark bill. Everybody pays a light bill. That's not so. We may not pay a dark bill now. I'm talking about spiritually. But if we don't live right, if we are not the light of the world, as the Bible projects that we should be and that we must be, if we are not that, we will pay a dark bill someday. You know, Every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall confess to the glory of the Father. So then, the Bible says, every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. And so you take the lesson tonight for what good it may do you, and, um, and just do your best in your spheres, in your life, wherever you are, on the job, at school, wherever, among our people, in the church, just do your best to be the light of the world. The path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. If you're subject to the call of the gospel tonight, will you come while we stand and while we sing?